بسم الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه من ولا اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم أرنا الحق حق وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطل وارزقنا اجتنابه والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So um, today is what, Saturday? Today's Saturday? Yes, okay. So Friday is, uh, Friday was the first day of the conference. I flew in uh, Thursday night. Now, um, my Thursday schedule was actually quite tight because I had just come in uh, from a previous convention that I was at in New Jersey. So I came in and it's been a while, like I, in terms of like my fitness and workout schedule or whatever, uh, when I travel, it just gets destroyed. So I came, I came home and like I had pretty much a day. And so I decided that you know, I'm going to try and get one workout in before I head out. And I know like at the convention, it's going to be almost impossible to head to the gym or whatever. So I go to, the, I go to my gym. And I'm on the Stairmaster, right? And uh, I see someone who I thought I recognized. Uh, and that person is a, a friend of mine, someone who I've known for a few years now, actually. He's from my community. And he's been slowly kind of finding his way back to Islam and getting in touch with his spirituality and so on and so forth. Uh, but recently, um, he was diagnosed with cancer. And basically, uh, I believe it was, it was lung cancer and, and actually the cancer spread to other parts of his body. So it's not looking good at all. And uh, he just recently got this news, I think just a, you know, maybe a few weeks ago, if not like two, two, two or three weeks ago. And so when I saw him in the gym, I was very surprised. And I was like, he's supposed to be at home, you know, and the reality is we don't know how, how much time he has, right? So, um, I, you know, I saw him walk by me, I messaged him, I'm like, salam alaikum, and I saw him go like this, and I'm like, behind you, and then he turns around, I'm like, hey, you know. So I run up to him, and I'm like, what's going on? Like, how are you? He's like, yeah, I'm doing a little bit better, you know, I, have, I had some energy today. So I wanted to just get out and do things that I would normally do. And it's like, even though I can't, like, you know, he was trying to, he usually plays basketball in the gym. And he's like, usually I'd play basketball, I'm just going to walk around, you know, the basketball court. So, um, so yeah, that was kind of heavy for me, right? Um, because here's me, I'm just planning for my day and I'm planning for my weekend and I'm like, you know, uh, I got to do X, Y, and Z today, like go to the gym and then do this and do that, go pick up a couple things and like all these chores that I have to get done and and then I'm thinking like way ahead, right? And it's like I hit this roadblock where all of a sudden getting in touch with, like seeing him, I immediately like pause and break and, and like my perspective, like in that very moment, uh, it completely changes. And then I started talking to him and I said, you know, I asked him how you're doing and so on and so forth. And I've, you know, I've counseled him a little bit before as well. And, uh, you know, he said, I'm, he said, I'm just taking it a day at a time. Right? And I said, you know, in reality, like if, if we were truly honest with ourselves, there's actually no difference between you and me. And here's why. You don't have tomorrow promised to you, right? And actually, he doesn't, they don't know, like I, from what I, the last I heard, the doctor said, we don't know. It could be days, weeks, maybe months, right? And I said, here's me walking around like I have the next day promised to me or the next 10 years or the next 40 years or whatever, but the reality is that, that I, don't, I don't have that. And the reality is that, you know, basically I have my time right now, and that's all that I can truly, truly guarantee. And so, in a way, and I, you know, in a way, all human beings, we're in that same boat, right? We're, we're basically, we don't have tomorrow guaranteed to us, right? What is, what is tomorrow? What is in the next moment? That is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we walk around like we've got, as I said, years promised to us, and sometimes we have this, like, you know, this, this number in our mind, and some, for some of us it's like 80 or 90, or for some of us we don't even really think about it. We don't think about death, we don't think about the end of our life, and, and that's normal, because as human beings we tend to not address things that are difficult to address. All right? And for a good portion of my life, actually, um, I didn't think about death. And those of you who know my story, you know, I started practicing Islam um, in college, and actually took my shahada, I accepted Islam in college, even though I came from a technically Muslim family. 
Uh, and one of the things that led me to, to Islam, and, and before Islam, I actually went through a, a journey of just looking for the purpose of life. And, you know, I, I looked at other faiths, you know, um, Christianity. Um, I looked into the, to the, uh, the Buddhist faith, the, you know, a few other faiths. And I found a lot of goodness uh, in all of these faiths. I mean, to be completely honest, there was some aspect of Christianity and the Jews, and the Buddhists, and they, they all had something that I was like, you know, this is good, this is nice. Um, but there was always something missing. There was always something that, that wasn't there. And it's when I came to Islam, and I came to Islam with a very negative, from a ne very negative perspective, very negative point of view, because for me, you know, as, as a young person, and has, you know, who's grown up with parents who are, you know, technically Muslim, um, it was hard to accept the fact that they had the truth and the truth was there in front of me my whole, my, my whole life and I, you know, I never accepted it. And I said, you know, obviously Islam cannot be the answer and, and obviously you know this as well. When you're young and during that age you tend to rebel against the things that are familiar to you, right? So I know people who are in love with the Qur'an today and they swear by the Qur'an and this and that, whatever. But growing up, they didn't want to memorize the Qur'an just because their parents were like forcing it on them, right? So it happens. So I, I came to Islam, and, and one of the things that, you know, led me to that point was, you know, I was going about my daily life, and, and people often ask me, did, did something happen in your life? Like, did, did, did you lose someone, or, or, you know, did you have like a, like a car crash, or like, usually that's t those type of things that, that trigger something for someone to really, like, change their life. And I don't, I, I used to say, no, nothing that dramatic happened at all. As a matter of fact, it was just a very normal day, but... It wasn't normal for me because that was the day that I started to ask myself the big questions in life. And one of those questions was, what is the purpose of my being here? And what am I supposed to do with, with my life? And how am I going to feel satisfied in my life? And how am I going to make sure, and actually this came from one of the uh, psychology classes I was taking, we were talking about how uh, many people at the end of their life, they, experienced, uh, they experience a deep sense of dread because they've lived their whole life and they thought they knew what life was about, right? Going day to day, they were just doing whatever they had to do and, and they thought that they had found happiness or at least they thought they knew where happiness was. And so they were chasing that happiness. And then someone shows up on their deathbed or you know, they're told they just have a little bit of time to live or you know, you're about to die and they look back at their life and, and they're, they're overcome with a, with a sense of dread. And you know, it's, it's very difficult because a person feels that they've dedicated their whole life to something that at this point, like, it, it doesn't mean anything to them, right? And, and if we look at the day-to-day -day stuff that we do, subhanAllah, in context of, like, not being alive anymore, it seems, it seems crazy that we would spend so much time even, like, having an argument with someone, right? And I know, whether it's online or otherwise, we spend so much time sometimes just trying to convince someone, and sometimes it's not even because we want them to understand our, it's just to prove them wrong, right? Just to have the upper hand. And if you look at it in context of, you know, how short our life actually is, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So, you know, once again, like when I met this friend of mine and, and talking to him, one of the things that, we, that I discussed with him is I said, you know, our early scholars, one of the things that they would say about life is that they would say your life is pretty much like you sitting here right now, your life is three moments. It's the moment that passed, the moment that you're in, and the moment that's going to come. And so if you look at these three moments, the moment that passed, well, it's gone. You can't do anything about it. You don't have control over it. Whatever happened, happened. Whatever you did, it's gone. Khras, you cannot change the past. And then there's the moment you're in, and then there's the moment that's going to come. Well, the moment that's going to come, we don't have a guarantee that we're going to have that moment. Right? So people who live their life always worried about the next moment. Well, how can you worry about something that may not even ever occur? And then there's the moment that you're in. And that is a moment that you really, truly have control over. And so you know how sometimes people say, like, just live in the moment? Part of that, yeah, like, I get it. If it's, if it's used in, in an irresponsible way, right, YOLO, I get it. It's not cool. But when I spoke to my friend and he said, you know, I'm just going, I'm just living day by day. You're like, this is the day that I have. And it made so much sense to me. And I said, you know, me too. Like, this is, 
this is the day that I have as well. And so what am I doing with my day to make sure that I'm not only keeping myself in this life fulfilled and, and I feel like I'm fulfilling the purpose of my life, but also preparing for the, for the afterlife. And that's why, subhanAllah, it's very amazing that when we start competing for this dunya, we can just get caught up in it. And it can seem like an endless battle. Whatever, whatever aspect of this dunya we're, we're competing in. And I often tell people, and people don't like to hear this, and you know, sometimes, sometimes people even get offended by the statement, but I always say, you know, you compete for this dunya, and, and you're always going to end up short. Right? There's always going to be someone, like, if it's about looks, there's always going to be someone better looking than you. If it's about popularity and fame, well, there's always going to be somebody more popular than you, somebody more famous. If it's about having people respect you and know you, well, there's always going to be someone else. Right? You, can, you, can think, you can think that you've achieved what you have to achieve from this life, and there's always going to be someone else who comes, and then you're like, oh, I wish I had that. Right? And that's why people who have a lot of wealth, for example, what do they spend their life doing? There's no, there's no point in their life where they're like, okay, now I'm done. Right? Like I've made enough money that I want to make. And like I said, we all have this, this life in our mind, right? this, this perfect life. Uh, especially a lot of young people, they're like, I just need X, Y, and Z. And I often say like, the, you know, someone says, you know, uh, I just need to get married, uh, make sure I'm making, I don't know, $200,000 or $300,000 a year. Um, I have two and a half kids. Uh, I have... Uh, a Bentley and whatever. Like, what I, you know, this is my ideal life. Oh, and my wife, she's got to be um, hot, right? Supermodel, but also hijabi, right? Or, for, or, or I got to marry a brother who's, you know, really on his dean or whatever. Mashallah, has a nice beard, like a hipster type beard. And also he's got a six pack or whatever it is, right? So it's this life that we have in mind. And then what we don't realize is that that's a fantasy. And the problem with fantasies is that fantasies are constantly changing, right? What, what happens when, if, when somebody does attain that life? When they do get that, that perfect life that they imagined? Well, what happens is, if they thought it is that particular life that's going to make them feel happy, that's, that's going to make them feel fulfilled, and maybe that, that hole in their soul that they're trying to fill with that fantasy life, or, you know, what some people call that, that spiritual hole, or, or that spiritual, spiritual darkness that looms over a lot of us, if we buy into the fact that, you know, it's that fantasy life, like if I just had that life, like everything will be fine. Well, during that, in, on that journey, you may be okay because you're still reaching towards something. But, but sometimes people achieving that dream of theirs or their fantasy is the worst thing for them. Because once they get there, they realize that's not the answer. And that makes that hole, that, that, that spiritual void, that spiritual darkness, it makes it even darker or makes that hole even larger. And that's why people will, at that point, usually, you know, I, I, we see it happen over and over again. People either maybe turn towards spirituality or they turn towards destructive behavior and they start, you know, going the other way. And that's why we have a lot of people who have tons of fame and money and whatever and status. And they turn to drugs or this or that and they end up in you know, with, with addictions to, to different things and, you know, end up so many problems, right? And, and like suicide and, and so on and so forth. And why? Well, I, it's not, I'm not going to simplify their lives, but one of the problems there is the fact that they, they lived their life and they achieved what they thought was a perfect life, what they thought is going to bring them happiness, what they thought is going to make them feel fulfilled. And once they got there, they didn't get the answers. They still feel unfulfilled. They still feel that darkness and they don't know what to do at that point. And so maybe like drugs will numb that feeling. And, and drugs do. They numb that feeling for, for a certain amount of time, right? And then that feeling is not numb anymore. And so you take more drugs and you take more drugs until you get addicted and until you reach a point, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, where it's like, what's the point of living anyway, right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And so it's when, you know, when we talk about this journey and, and, and this life that we have, we think we have it under control. And the reality is that no one has it under control. The reality is that we need the, the assistance and support of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know, oftentimes, you know, when we talk, like when I talk about this topic, when I talk about death, when I talk about how life is, is fleeting 
and we, and we talk about how we don't have a guarantee on, on the moments that come ahead of us, I often get accused of being morbid, or people, you know, accuse Muslims of being morbid, right? Like, Muslims are so morbid, you're always talking about death, and so on and so forth, right? And actually, the Prophet he encouraged, her, encouraged us to remember death. He said, He said, increase in remembering the destroyer of desires. And the desires that he's talking about here is not all desires. He's talking about those desires that are destructive to our lives or destructive to our spirituality. Right? So, Prophet said, increase in remembering that which destroys one's desires. He said, al maut, right? Death. So you often hear people saying that, you know, Muslims are, are, are so morbid. Or like we're always talking about death. And that's not actually true. Because as Muslims, number one, we don't believe that death is the end. Right? If we believe that death was the end, then yeah, we could say maybe we're morbid. But we believe death is a transition from this life to the life of the hereafter. Right? And not only that, our goal, because we understand death and because we understand how fleeting this life is, our goal is to make the most out of the moment that we're in that I mentioned earlier. It is to maximize our potential in what we have been given. So not everyone has the same resources. Not everyone has, for example, the same internet following. Not everyone is, is the same. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us all to be different. And even if we look at our physical selves and our bodies and so on and so forth, you know, we live in this life where we put everyone on the same playing field. And we have these standards and we can compare everyone to those standards. And it's led to so many problems, especially in like the younger generation. You know, and I deal with this all the time. You know, the issue of uh, body image and, and, and self-esteem. It's plaguing this generation. Because what, what do we, all we do is we constantly compare ourselves to others. We constantly compare ourselves to this, to this fantasy of what we are supposed to look like. You know, even a, a young Muslim girl or a young Muslim boy, and it used to be, by the way, it was just girls, or it was mostly girls, that had to live up to this impossible standard. Now it's, it's becoming like that for guys and, and boys as well. Right? So just like you know, on Instagram, you have fitness models, you have girls that are fitness models, and you have guys that are fitness models as well. Right? And so th this, is, I mean, this, is, this is the life that we're living, where we're constantly comparing ourselves to, uh, to others. And it's led to a point where like, that's, that's what we're chasing, and, 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 and that's, what we're, that's what we're after. But imagine, subhanAllah, you were told that you have to, you have to reach your potential. You have to try your best. You have to be your best self in the moment that you're in. Just worry about that. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about 10 years from now. Right? Worry about, look at the moment that you're in. Are you doing your best? Are you trying your best? to be the best version of yourself. And I know, you know, I mentioned the Stairmaster earlier, and I know, like, people think this is, like, a really dumb example, right? But when I'm on the Stairmaster, one of the things that I'm thinking to myself is, am I reaching my potential right now, right? And I know it sounds stupid, and it sounds, like, really shallow. I get that. But it's not just the Stairmaster. It's anything that we're doing in life, right? Whatever thing, whatever whatever project that we've taken on or whatever, whatever we're doing, once we've made the decision that this is what brings the most amount of benefit, and that's, that's the other thing. Not only are we trying our best in the moment that we're in, but also, if we are limited in time, if the only thing we can really guarantee for ourselves in that moment, can we ask ourselves the question, am I doing the thing that is of most benefit right now? Not only to myself, but also in the world that I'm living in. Because once again, it's very easy to get sidetracked. It's very easy to get caught up in conclusions and outcomes. But it's another thing to say, look, this life that I'm living right now, am I picking things for myself that where I'm going to be of, of the absolute most benefit? And you know, recently uh, in my community, um, the community, like the board, approached me. And they said to me, they said, you know, you're, you've lived here for a long time and you give like khutbahs and lectures and talks here, like in the masjid. But we want, you to, we want to have you on like, at, like an, an official capacity. And from the very beginning of, of me, like public speaking or whatever, my one rule has always been like, I don't want to become an imam. Right? 
I have no interest in becoming an imam, and I, and I get offers all the time, and so on and so forth. Like, pretty much, you know, wherever I go, if there's a need, if the, if the community doesn't have an imam, I, got, I, I get asked, like, can you, can you be the imam? Or so, and I'm like, no. And in one of the discussions I was having with, with the board um, was this. I told, I, told him, I told him simply, look, I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing, I, I'm, I'm doing the best that I can do, right? I'm reaching my potential. But also, I want to make sure that I'm, it's the best use of my time. Because, wallahi, I don't know how long I can do this for. Not only is my life limited, but even my resources are, are limited. Maybe today I'm doing this, wallahi, tomorrow, and this is like a, a painful thought, but tomorrow, if for some reason they put me on the no-fly list, may Allah protect me, right? Say, ameen, ameen. <laughs> then that's it. I can't, I can't travel, right? And I, I hate driving. So it's just, it's not happening, right? That's it. And that's not in my hands. So I can worry about that. Or I can worry about saying, look, right now, in the moment that I'm in, in what I'm doing, I want to pick those types of, of, of classes and those types of things that I know that I'm reaching, the, like, I, I'm doing the best that I can do with my time. So I told him, I said, straight up, sitting uh, in a boardroom and, like, arguing with the board, and arguing with like the president of the masjid because like we have a different opinion on some matter or like like I'm like that's with with all due respect that's a waste of my time because like I don't want to do that right I just I want to go and I, like I just this is what I want to do I want to speak to people one on one right without any red tape without and alhamdulillah things like al maghrib has allowed me to do that and given me that flexibility and even now the conferences and conventions that I go to like I pick Right? Like I decide, and not everyone has that luxury, by the way. There's some people who, they're in a situation where they have to take a position at, at, at the masjid. But for me, that's one of the things I, I told even my local community, which, you know, I've lived there for years. And I feel very much part of that, uh, of that community, and I, don't want, I want to continue to do programs there. But that's one of my things. Like right now, I have the flexibility to pretty much say, hey, I'm available at this time. Uh, is there an availability in the masjid? They say yes. I say, okay, I want to talk about this. I want to speak about this matter. I want to give a khutbah. And, like, that's it. And, I, and I, had a, I had another thought about this matter, subhanAllah. And that is, you know, I really thought to myself, especially after talking to my friend two days ago. And I thought to myself, if today was my last day, how would my message change? Right? Because I'm coming, you know, I'm coming here to Chicago. I'm speaking to all of you, which is an immense responsibility. Right? The fact that you give me your time, you give me your precious moments of your day. What do, I, what do I want to say? You know, in that moment that I thought that, I felt incredibly free. Because as a speaker, like just hashtag real talk, we have to be very careful about what we say and how we say it. Because things are misconstrued all the time. Things are taken out of context. We live in a very polarized world, right? And we just have to be wise about how we say certain things. And I thought to myself, I said, if this is my last day, who cares? Right? Who cares? I'm going to say what I believe to be the absolute truth and what I believe people need to hear, regardless of how many people right, may take it in, in, in the wrong way. And yes, it's not that it's a license to offend people because I think offending people is problematic in the sense that it goes against the message. So if you've ended up offending people, then you haven't reached them. You've turned them away, right? So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not here in defense of it's okay to offend people. We should be careful about how our message is received, right? But in terms of being fearful of the consequences in terms of people may not like what I'm saying and therefore, well, if this is our last day, then how would we lead our lives? Right? How would, our, how would, our, how would our, our life differ? And so I want to leave you with a couple things, inshallah ta'ala, for today. And what, what I want this to be is just a reminder. Because the reality is we are surrounded by death and we are surrounded by reminders, but there's only few who pay attention. And we live in this crazy world where something happens and we immediately hear about it. And in a way, it's good because it's a reminder, but it's, in a way, it's bad because we've become so desensitized. Right? When we're constantly looking at death and we're constantly looking at destruction and we're constantly looking at those who are suffering, well, at some point, we get desensitized. 
So one of the pieces of advice that I'm going to give you may seem counterintuitive, and that is to turn off the news and really be selective of how much media you expose yourself to, how much news you expose yourself to. Because if you're constantly looking at streams and streams and streams of death and destruction, that yes, I mean, it should move us, but Wallahi, I have been at like Islamic relief fundraisers where they are literally interviewing women who the day before saw, you know, this woman who did, the day before she saw her husband killed right in front of her eyes and the day before she was also raped and the day before her, her, her young boys were killed as well. And now she's sitting by herself with her daughter, her newborn daughter, and she's just been through that experience. And wallahi, the brother's interviewing her, her and the brother can't speak because, because, you know, he can't hold back his tears. And I look, I look out and I see a room full of people, like half of them are like texting and this and that or whatever. And look, I get it, right? I'm okay with people like being on their phones or whatever. And half of them are just disconnected and I really, it, it hurt. Wallahi, it hurt. Like what has happened to our humanity? What has happened to our sense of empathy that we can witness something like this? Like it doesn't get more real than that. Right? It does, it does. Wallahi, it doesn't get more real than that. And if we, if we, and, and we see that stuff and it doesn't have an effect on us, there's something wrong. We've completely, we've just hidden away, right? And, and when a calamity comes upon us, you know, one of the first things, you know, the five stages of grief, one of the first stages is denial. And I feel like as a world, you know, like, and that's a, that's a convenient stage, right? That's one of the first things we do, we deny it, right? I'm not saying we deny what's happening, but on a subconscious level, we're like, if I don't think about it, it's not happening. And this really hit me when, when somebody was like, hey, check out this video. And I was like, dude, I don't want to see it. And then I asked myself, I said, why am I saying that? It's because that means I have to think about it. And that means I have to think about that child that is suffering. And then I have to think about their family. And I have to think about their, their whole world. Right? And then I thought to myself, am I denying myself the ability to empathize? And that is problematic. Wallahi, that is problematic. So what I'm saying here is be careful of, of how much you expose yourself to, but we should be exposed. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ said, Increase in, in remembering the destroyer of desires and yani, as he said that which connects you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And really that is our connection, right? So the connection to the afterlife is is our death So once death becomes real to us Then we will be able to connect with that afterlife And like I said, it's not about giving up on this life and you know oftentimes people quote the hadith of the traveler, right? Kun fi dunya like be in this life as if you're just like a passing traveler and sometimes people take from that that you're supposed to not care about care about this world right like oh I could die tomorrow what's the point of any of anything and actually when I started practicing Islam some people actually told me that right they're like why do you even bother like you know why do you care about the way you dress or the way you look or this or that or what? like why do you care about what people think of you and this? because you could die tomorrow well that's not how we're supposed to live our lives as a Muslim as I said, death only means that we make the most of the moments that we are in, that we try our best. And I think it was yesterday in this same room, I believe, I mentioned the, the hadith of the person, the Prophet said that if the hour approaches and you have in your hand the ability to plant a tree, you should plant the tree. Well, that is an analogy for life. If we have the ability to, to do even a little bit of good, then we should do it. Even a tiny amount of good that we are able to do it because wallahi tomorrow is not promised and in another session I, you know, I was talking about it was here actually, I was talking about sincerity and how we don't know wallahi, we don't know what deed of ours could be that one deed that takes us to paradise and we all know the hadith of the, of the woman who gave water to a thirsty dog right and everybody knows what her profession was right she was a prostitute and that, that hadith is so amazing for the very fact that regardless of a person's level of religiosity, most people would say, yeah, being a prostitute, yeah, you made some bad life choices, right? Like that's not, like even someone who, who's not, even someone who doesn't even believe in God may say, well, yeah, that's not the best thing to do. Or like morally, there's a lot of problems there. So this type of person that, you know, normally, we would look at a person like that and we would immediately make a, a million judgments about her. 
We would shame her. Imagine, subhanAllah, a woman walks into our community and we know that she's a prostitute and she wants to come in the masjid and pray. How would we treat her? Right? Not, I'm not saying she made tawbah and she, she gave up the life or what. No. She's like, yeah, this is what I do for a living. Or I work at the strip club, right? And I want to come, come pray with you. How would we react? Because we would make a thousand, thousand judgments about her. This is the type of woman that the Prophet ﷺ told us. Because of one sincere action she did for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what was that action? Did she, did, she, did she save someone's life? No. There was a dog who was thirsty. And you know, subhanAllah, this, this, once again, this, this narration is so amazing because Muslims as a whole, like we have this thing with dogs, right? We're just not feeling dogs. Right? Anytime a dog comes, we're like, oh, okay, nice dog from afar, right? And, and so that is the type of animal that I imagine, I, I have this crazy, this crazy thing in my mind. I often think about this. Like imagine if Allah gave me that opportunity, right? And I didn't even know. Like I'm, I'm on the street and there's a dog that's panting and it comes up to me and, and it starts like licking my, you know, my jeans or whatever. And I'm like, ew. And I was like, that was my ticket to paradise. But I didn't know, right? Because I was too caught up on, oh, I'm going to have to wash my shirt or whatever it may be. That is the animal that she gave water to, right? Just water, water. She brought some water, she fed this animal that was thirsty. But because of her sincerity in that action, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave her sins. And she went to paradise. So how can we belittle any moment that we are in? How can we put off till tomorrow what we could do today? Wallahi, that one sajda, that I, and I often mention that example, the example of that sajda. When we're in sajda, we always think to ourselves, yeah, what is it really worth? And how many more sajdas am I going to make? Instead of saying, you know, this is the one sajda. Maybe it is this one single, was one prostration. And by the way, if you're looking for a spiritual moment, and we live in an environment where we are desperate for spirituality, right? And, and it's so ironic because we are, we are, we are surrounded with knowledge, we're, we're surrounded with scholars, we're, we're surrounded with, with resources of, of gaining knowledge. I mean, look at this whole weekend, subhanAllah. We're all here learning together, and we're, but in terms of that spiritual connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we feel starved. And one of the reasons is we don't pay attention. We don't pay attention to those moments that are constantly around us. One of the most powerful spiritual experiences is the experience of putting your forehead the highest part of your body, the most noble part of your body, and putting it on the ground, even if it's dirty, right? That's why, you know, like, sajjada or not, janamahs or not, doesn't matter, right? Even if it's dirty, and the, and, and the companions, they would make sajda on dirt. Their masjid didn't have carpets and, you know, this, like this nice foam and things like that. And their, their salah wasn't just like, oh, this feels so comfy. Like, that's not how they prayed, right? They put, their, they put their foreheads on the dirt. They humiliated, the, they humbled themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that moment, they felt like they were, this is the most humble physical position that a human being can be in. With their forehead to the ground. And wallahi, we don't do it for anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Forehead to the ground, pouring our heart out to the one who is the most high. If we really, really thought about that, then that would be an extremely powerful spiritual situ moment. Likewise, a funeral. You know when the, when the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, when they would be carrying the body out to a funeral, people would say that for long periods of time, we would hear nothing, no words, no one saying anything except tears and crying. And you know, it's not just the family. Like, I know now when we go to funerals, like the family's crying and, and, every, and everyone else is like, yeah, this, this sucks, but you know, let's get this moving, right? I got to get back to work, whatever. This funeral's taking way too long. And even look at the, the amount of people that come to the masjid versus the amount of people that follow the body out to the grave site, right? It's, and you know, that, that, the, the way we treat death, once again, because we've become so desensitized, it's very different. But for the companions, that moment... Was, was, a, was a very powerful moment. 
Right? And the Prophet ﷺ himself, he said, uh, He said, I, I had forbidden you from going to the, to the, to the graves. ولكن زوروها. He said, rather now I'm saying, visit them, go to the graves. فَإِنَّا تُذَكِّرُكُمْ بِالْمَوْتِ For certainly they remind you of death. They connect you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And that's what death is supposed to be. That is, that is understanding that our life is fleeting, that it's short. It's supposed to be an avenue for us to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And in the end, this serves as, as, as a reminder because wallahi, we need reminders. And that's why when I get asked to give a talk like this, and this is like maybe, like I've given a talk like this over a dozen times, I always get very happy. Because, and I know we've all heard a talk on death and so on and so forth, but we, we need reminders, right? And that's my third point. So, so, no, so number one, look for those powerful spiritual moments to reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about how your life is just moments. Number two, visit the graves and attend funerals. And number three, my, my, my brothers and sisters, is the very fact that we need people around us to help remind us. Right? We need people around us who, who will be like, you know what, something bad happened or whatever. They'll say, look, this is, you know, how, how, how crazy is it that we are actually witnessing this? Because there's often people that we keep around us and, and it's, it's a comfortable feeling that they're around us because they help us forget or they help us not think about what is actually happening. Right, and even Subhanallah, you know, I, I know these days, um, what is it, the uh, the Daily Show with Trevor Noah? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's cool that you know they talk about serious things in a, in a comedic way, but a lot of times the topics that are being discussed on on the Daily Show, like I, I just I, part of it, I, I just I don't understand it because they you know they had a segment, you know, Alhamdulillah, they had a segment. On the, on the Muslims in Burma and you know, the, the genocide that is taking place, but it was like peppered with jokes and things like that. And, which, and, I, and, I, and I get it, I get the point of it, right? It's so, you know, the, the, you know, the people as a whole, people who normally wouldn't watch something like that would watch it and be educated, fine. But as a Muslim, right, we have to be at a higher level than that. It's, you know, jokes are fine and, and jokes have a place and even to joke is sunnah, I taught a whole, taught a whole class on you know, laughing and joking and so on and so forth. But there's a time and place and one of the etiquettes of joking is that there's a time and place. And there's a time and place to be reminded. Right? There's a time and place where we do get serious. You know, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, there's a narration about them. One of my favorite narrations. It mentions that in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, not any masjid, in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, the second holiest place on earth, I believe this mentioned Sahih Muslim. He said that the narrator says the companions were running around and smacking each other with melon rinds, right? So they didn't have like Nerf guns and stuff, right? So they would just take melon rinds and they're running around like pop, pop, right? These are grown men. That's the type of playful nature that they had. And then in the same narration, it says, however, when the matter became serious, then they were serious. Right? Meaning there's time, there's a time for this and there's a sa'atan wa sa'a. There's an hour for this and an hour for this. Right? It's that other hour that we have a problem with usually. The hour when it's time to become serious. When it's time to contemplate. So keep people around you and ask yourselves if, if you don't have people around you that remind you of the reality of this life and, and the fleeting nature of this life, then maybe you need to be that person. And I'm not saying you, you, know, you walk around and just be like, Remember you're going to die. Remember you're going to die. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying everything has a time and place. And so when those reminders come, when we see an, a calamity happen or you know, we see a death in the community or a family or whatever it may be, that we can, that, we can be that person that can be like, you know what, um, this could have been us. Right? We don't know. Like we, you know this could have been us. To remind us of this is... This is, this, is, this is life, right? And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ذكر فإن ذكرة فعل مؤمنين. Right? We're not perfect. We're not always going to be, you know, fully understanding of the reality of this life. And that's why we all need reminders. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this session served as a reminder, first of all, for myself and for all of you as well. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubulik.